My first job with AFI Silver was handling the shipping, uh, the shipping and the booking and all that. And even though that's not a primary duty for me right now, um, it is absolutely a true statement in terms of what's essential about how you make a theater work. That's Todd Hitchcock, director of programming at the American Film Institute Silver Theater and Cultural Center here in Silver Spring, Maryland. On today's edition of Labor Goes to the Movies, we'll have part one of my chat with Todd. He talks about how AFI has kept the movies coming during the pandemic, and we get a peek behind the glitz and the glamour of attending star-studded film festivals at Cannes, Berlin, and Toronto as Todd reveals some of the workaday details of being a film programmer at one of the nation's premier movie art houses. Let's start off with the trailer for Work Songs, which opens the 2021 DC Labor Film Fest this week. It's showing in the AFI's virtual screening room now. We've got a link in the show notes, or go to afi.com silver and click on DC Labor Film Fest. Also, just a reminder that the new film Haymarket is now screening online for free. Check the show notes for a link, or go to dclabor.org and click on DC Labor Fest. There will be two labor discussions with director Adrian Pravica on May Day, Saturday, May 1st. The first is at 8 p.m. Eastern Time with labor historians Joe McCartan from Georgetown University and Stephen Breyer from the CUNY School of Labor. The second, at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, is with labor studies professor Dana Frank. Both will include Q&A with the audience, so you'll get a chance to talk with the filmmaker and with the labor historians as well. Okay, here's the show. Are you poor, forlorn, and hungry? Are there lots of things you lack? Is your life made up of this? No matter what Uber does, we're going nowhere. We're here, we're here to stay. Now I produce video games, and um, I never fully clock out. My father was a longshoreman, and when I was 18, I got to carry on that legacy. So I'm fourth generation longshoreman. The Wobblies have always said, I don't mind the machine, I just don't want to be his victim. I didn't have a high school degree, and nobody would hire me at that point. You're constantly reminded that you're the woman woodworker. Just want to clear a path for girls that might be interested, but don't feel like the world is saying it's for them. I have the privilege of participating in land redemption. It's really, really satisfying. I want everyone to get across safely, let everyone feel special. I take it with so much pride and so much love. Sipping up to ornery duffers and dump the bosses off your back. Welcome to Labor Goes to the Movies. We're talking today with Todd Hitchcock, Director of Programming at American Film Institute's Silver Theater and Cultural Center. Welcome, Todd. Thanks, Chris. So uh, before we get into this year's DC Labor Film Fest lineup, I should say fabulous Labor Film Fest lineup, uh, I want to just take a moment to take a step back in time to March 2020. I don't want you to have any PTSD flashbacks here, but the pandemic forced uh, AFI to shut down. I think it was literally overnight, if I'm not mistaken. And I was wondering if you could just share a bit with folks about what that was like from the inside. Oof, okay, yeah, <laughs> right, shaking up the PTSD. Uh, let's, let's see, uh, if, if, if people do think back to it, March 2020, February, March, how, how the, the awareness of the worsening pandemic, um, day by day, hour by hour even, um, what the realities were for people uh, were coming into effect and, and when the, um, orders uh, came out for eventually shutting down most uh, public facing businesses. 
um, yeah, of course, of course that affected us. And uh, I think our last weekend was March 13, 14, 15, and Monday, March 16, we closed. I think that was the date, uh, which was right in there within a span of a couple of days of, of how most businesses, including movie theaters, had to close down. And it, yeah, in, in that immediate moment, sort of what's next was very much an unknown thing. Uh, being that it was March, Chris, you and I had begun, more than begun, uh, our contact about what we might be doing a few months later uh, in May for the Labor Film Fest, for the 2020 edition of that. And um, uh, j for the listeners out there, that's the kind of thing where you're, you, you, you begin the process many months in advance and you tighten it up a couple of months before you, you go out there. Uh, but, but just just for reference, we, we, we've recently announced the, what the lineup is in, in this year's 2021 edition. We'll be talking about that a little later, but Chris and I have also been talking about ideas for down the road. Uh, so, so in a sense, we're already thinking a, a year down the road for, uh, for the next edition. Uh, so yeah, in, in March, we, we had a notion of what we might be doing. We had a long list and, and had started um, investigating some possibilities, but that had to go on the shelf. Um, because there was there was nothing nothing that we planned to do in person for 2020 was going to happen at that point and and the films that we had on screen at the point we closed that that was it now a few days later a, a week later something emerged something that we something that didn't exist before that which was the idea of uh, virtual cinema uh, on you know pre presenting films online which of course is part of the entertainment landscape and has been for a long time a dominant part of it even uh but the idea that an art house cinema would be presenting films that way was not something that had been in play until then and um a big a big thanks to all of the independent um art house uh distributors in in the u.s who rushed to fill that void and not only to Put their own stuff online and they're already doing that in various ways but specifically to say we're going to reach out to the theaters that we normally work with and deal them in they didn't have to do that but they recognize that we're all in this together as part of a shared business space and again huge huge credit and thanks to i'm talking about magnolia pictures oscilloscope laboratories kino lorber music box films um uh, among others, uh, film movement, but th these were some of the uh, companies that were among the first to enter enter that space, and others followed. And that's what we've been doing the last year. We, uh -huh. the the theater has been physically closed, AFI Silver, but AFI Silver has been presenting. I haven't tallied it up. It's multiple hundreds of titles at this point. We would typically open five a week. Uh, new new releases online. Our our virtual cinema program, our virtual screening room. And the first few months that was, hey, we're, we're doing something, we're continuing to engage our audience, we're continuing to promote these films. We started a podcast that went along with that. And you know, with, within days of, we just closed the theater, we don't know what's next, to have something going that was continuing the program was huge. Uh, ne never mind that it wasn't selling tickets anywhere near the amount that you would have with in person, but to have some sort of energy activity with the program and keep it going over the past year, it's it has been a, a lifesaver. It really, it really has. And we've shown some terrific films that way. Uh, and once we sort of got our sea legs with the new way of doing things, the what you know, the the temporary situation for getting through 2020, we we eventually did bring in some of the annual series, uh, but that, that came later. And, and that was another step actually, uh, where we had to become familiar with uh, a lot of different, a lot of new technology that we weren't, we weren't using before. So um, the, the version of presenting films online that we started with in March and April, uh, six months down the road, we had brought in a, a lot more hardware and software to, to make it happen to do some of our our annual festivals. So this uh, it's is a much longer conversation that we don't have time for here. But I'm just curious. I mean, you and, and I and, and obviously the AFI audience is is really committed to 
you know, so the in-person experience, that's, that's, you know, being in the theater, you know, with other people in the dark, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, you and I also as programmers spend a lot of our time watching screeners on laptops or TVs, you know, so we're, we're used to that. A lot of folks have gotten used to that over the last year, uh, but just, you know, in a very quick way, do you have thoughts about this moving forward? I mean, there's talk about, you know, that we're never going back to the old ways. Um, and again, that's a longer conversation we'll have in the future, but I'm just having, having been through this, um, I'm just curious to your thoughts about about uh, you know, sort of the future of, of the in in person, which I can't wait to get back myself. Uh, same, and uh, you know, many many places have have uh, reopened recently. Uh, as far as I know, the the attendance isn't significant right now, with a few exceptions. Godzilla versus King Kong, I think, did incredibly well considering the the situation with uh, it's not on as many screens as a, as a widely distributed film ordinarily would be. And you've got capacity limitations uh, pretty much everywhere that, it's, that it is playing. Um, uh, you know, leave aside what your own interest might be in seeing a film called Godzilla versus King Kong. <laughs> a lot of people went to see it. Is that, um, a, labor, is that a labor film? I forget. <laughs> I don't think so, but I haven't seen it. So let me get back to you. Uh, but I, I think as a bellwether of gauging interest in returning to theaters and the theatrical experience, I think it's pretty significant. And give it a few weeks. The, the Hollywood release schedule, when you look down the road into later May and June and July, it is starting to look like a normal, some version of normal release schedule. As I think everyone out there listening is aware, Everything that was on the calendar would set release dates in 2020 all the way into early 21. All the big stuff, most of the big stuff got removed, pushed down the road, uh, dates changed. A lot of films had their dates changed multiple times. Uh, for people who follow this thing more closely, they may be aware that studios sold films uh, rather than, than hold them back. Right. Uh, they, they sold them to other distributors, including uh, 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 entities like Netflix and Amazon that are primarily uh, releasing films directly to the online version of things. Uh, and in, in some cases, companies decided to do go, go digital uh, streaming on their own. So, so, let, let, so let, Disney titles went directly out on, on Disney+. Plus. But I want to make it real specific. And, 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 and you know, you uh, probably show, don't know the answer to this, but uh, for sure. But I'm just curious... Uh, you know, are you looking at AFI at potentially a hybrid situation going back or once you're able to reopen in person, is it going to be yeah. all back in person? Yes. Yeah. I, I was, I was going to get to that, but just oh, okay. sort of, you know, what, what happened to the films that were supposed to come out in the last year and right. you know, di different things, but a lot of them still haven't come out yet. And now ah. that we're starting to reopen theaters, we're going to get to see them in theaters. And there's evidence, a lot of evidence out there that the public wants to see things in a theater, they want to see it big, they want to hear it big, they want to get out of the house. So, <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea that that's not a viable business anymore, I say nay to that. I think, uh, I think we'll be seeing articles. I already started to see them a little bit about theater going is back in a big way. And, All right. And I think that's great. Yes. And AFI Silver is going to be part of that too. We are still working on nailing down what the day is going to be. And there's I think people can imagine a lot of ducks to get in a row to, oh, yeah. to get there, but it's, it's getting close. So uh, stay tuned. We should have some good news about that fairly soon. Well, people can check out your podcast and uh, certainly on Labor Goes to the Movies, we will be keeping people posted on that. All right. Here's the question we ask everybody. Uh, we, I, I never can predict the answer, so I don't even try, but um, what was the first film that you remember that really kind of stands out in that, I'm assuming you were a kid most, you know, when you first saw your film. What's, what's, what's the film that really stands out for you? Okay, so, so you, you want my earliest, what I believe my earliest recollection is? or Not like necessarily the, the your earliest early, big. Yeah, the one, the one that really kind of pops in your mind that really affected you. And, and I'm yeah. thinking, you know, maybe even set you on the path to becoming, you know, the chief programmer, number one programmer here at AFI. You know? <laughs> I don't know if it's I, true, but I, <laughs> that's the story I'm telling. 
uh, well, you know, every, everything's a link in the chain, but that, that, that definitely came later. Um, you know, it, it'd be convenient to say something like Star Wars and, and Chris, you, you and I, I think probably saw Star Wars in the theater close to the same age as, as young kids. I mean, I was, I was six, almost seven. Yeah, almost seven uh, when I saw it. And I, I share that not to, to age myself. That's, that's, that is what it is. Uh, but just to make the point, I was the primary demo. Yeah, you were. <laughs> so, you, you <laughs> I, <tell know>. you. <laughs> um, I mean, a, a little older as far as like the repeat traffic, but as far as what followed soon on with the marketing and the toys and, and what a big deal that was to, to myself and people from my generation. And, um, but that's, that's not necessarily the first film I, I saw in a movie theater, even though it was a, made a huge impression and it was probably among the earliest films I, I went with my family to see in a theater. But to answer your question, I, I have vague memories, they're incomplete, uh, of my father taking me to see Pinocchio, which would have been in you know, some kind of periodic re-release like Disney used to do uh, at our, at our uh, older hometown rundown theater, which was you know, a relic from another era. And I, and I loved it and it, you know, it was still going when I, when I was old enough to go on my own to see, to see films around age 12, things like Raiders of the Lost Ark and and, and other films from 82 that around that time. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like, did I see that in the theater? Or did I see that in the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday nights, you know? But I'm, I'm pretty sure that he took me to see Pinocchio when I was really young, like four. Wow. Thereabouts. And, you know, parts of Pinocchio are kind of scary, kind of intense. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I thought it was a terrifying film. He, he gets in a lot of trouble and it's, oh, it's, yeah. it's looking bad. And he, you know, very narrowly escapes uh, the dire fates that some of the other little boys uh, encounter. The thing with the donkeys is pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> getting turned into a donkey, <laughs> a donkey boy. Uh, so I just, I, almost as if I was watching through my fingers, I have the sort of scraps of memory. And the reason I'm pretty sure it was in the theaters because the, the scale of it is in my head, not, mm -hmm. not the way it would look on TV. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say, earliest memory that comes through from the very, very, very early phase of even having memories, but probably about four, four years old seeing Pinocchio in the, in the theater. Very cool. Now, another little side trip before we, we get to the, the 2021 DC Labor Film Fest. Uh, I had forgotten, we've worked together over a decade now. I, I've kind of lost track. It's a long time we've been working together. Uh, one thing that folks probably don't know is that we have a Rochester, New York connection. Uh, my family moved up there in the early 70s. My dad was actually a grad student in labor history at the University of Rochester, which I'd forgotten is where you went to school. And a quick story for me is I didn't go to U of R, although, you know, as a kid of a graduate student, it was my playground. I hung out there. I don't know if you remember a guy named George Grella it was a film oh, history. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, George was a critic for the city paper and a professor there. When I used to hang out there, the film uh, the film program was like very small. They had these little rooms, but I remember just being able to walk in, literally grab reels of film with these yeah. you know, projectors and just go watch them in a room, which you know, at the time was pretty darn cool because other than that, you actually had to go to you know, say the Eastman House or one of the rep theaters in town. But I was just curious about any memories you have of that time. Oof! Yeah, this. this, this Sorry, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. We've prep already you for this we've one. already gone back to the seventies. So going back to eighties, <laughs> nineties, we can do that too. So yeah, I, I attended the University of Rochester, and uh, and it was it was a very good experience overall. And I and I grew up uh, not not really close, but not far away, uh, closer to Syracuse, a small town, central New York. So. Um, well, I can say I remember George Grella. I took I took a class a, a film class with George Grella. I remember enjoying uh, uh, George's uh, reviews for the Rochester City Paper. Um, he 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 was. I remember he's typically pretty tough, but he was entertaining as a as a reviewer, um, as he was as a professor in class. And yeah, what what was then called the the film lab. This is pre digital, so that meant the university's collection of 16 millimeter copies of various films, a, a lot of good films, a lot of international films, um, a, a lot of rarities, uh, but in the 16 millimeter format. And yeah, it was, um, you 
you are your own projectionist, not, not in a room with literal projection, but Steenbeck's. Uh, for those of you who recognize that term, you, you know what I'm talking about. But you're gonna have to tell you know, me what that is. <laughs> uh, yeah, like a, a flat bed editor. So imagine yep. two two reels horizontal on a table with a, a little uh, nine twelve inch screen in the middle. Yep. Uh, tiny little screen. Al almost like tiny it was made in screen. shop class, you know, yep. with like a, a metal hood over it. But you would run the reel to reel, you would run the film for yourself and, and watch it on your viewer. Um, and if, if you needed to, to if, you, if you missed the screening for class, if you needed to do further research on, on whatever film for something that you were gonna write about for your class, you could go to the library and, and do it yourself. So um, I, I definitely, this would be 91, 92, 93, somewhere in there, um, remember, uh, go, going there and, and enjoying the whole process of that. And by way of example, I did, uh, I remember I did a paper on F.W. Murnau and uh, watched five or six additional Murnau titles that they had 16 millimeter prints of uh, on, on the steam back in the, in the film library. Now I assume I've not set foot on that back to U of R or really any other college campus in the intervening years, but I assume it's a, it's a digital kind of setup and you, you could just, go to a website and patch into what the university has available, probably a, a library kind of system. But let me ask you this, and, and I'm just thinking out loud here, um, because I had that I, I, same thing. I was, I was working on this thing, and you had, to, you had to, you know, literally put the reels on there and run them, and it was a tiny little screen. What I'm wondering is if that experience, that tactile experience of actually seeing a film and having a physical connection to the film, did it be because before that you would watch films like the rest of us in a theater yeah right? or uh you know ca cable television and cable video rental okay yeah, that's 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 a definitely a component of uh 80s 90s cinephilia as well but what i'm wondering is whether that helped to to you know make you more of a i think you see films differently when you see it like that. It's less of that experience in the theater where you're swept away. I, I always found it hard to really get lost in the film, yeah. but I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, well, um, uh, re regarding the tactile experience, I mean, that's that's something uh, that I appreciate. And, you know, for there, there's a certain breed of cat who's in it for the, the machines. <laughs> They, they come to it from from that side of right. stuff, and, and that's that's part of it. And a, anyone who's gotten a, a glimpse of how a theater works, I think, can at least appreciate that. Uh, you now, being a gearhead for projectors is is another is another thing. Um, but I but I appreciate that. And I especially appreciate uh, everything involved in the world of film archiving, and, and we'll talk about that in a, in a in a second. Um, but what uh, a, a lesson I learned fairly early on, and it was, I, I guess you could say it was, I was a beneficiary of, uh, again, something that I could say started at U of R. Um, the difference you're talking about, yes. When you, when you see a film on the big screen, I, I think the perfect example is the film you've seen before at home on television, uh, on, on cable or rental. And then you see it on the big screen and it's like you're seeing it for the first time because it's sure. making such a bigger impression and you're picking up on things you haven't seen. The, the, the scale, it's so, it's so taken for granted, but the, simply the scale of seeing it big has a different effect than how you might've seen it on a smaller screen. Um, and that's, that's the thing that was made. That's how it's supposed to be seen and experienced and heard. And of course, the darkened auditorium, hopefully no interruptions, all of that. Uh, when I was at University of Rochester, and I should point out, I was not a film studies major. I, I, I ended up taking a lot of film courses and kind of left school that that's what I was interested in now, but my major was actually English and history. Uh -huh. But I, like I said, I worked in quite a bit uh, of film studies at the end. I did reviews for the campus newspaper my last year uh, and there, and I also had an internship at the George Eastman House. Uh, which is now called the George Eastman Museum. And you're, you're familiar with that. George Eastman is the founder of Kodak. And the museum is a combination of his big old mansion, um, but also a film archive. And it's kind of, it's, it's an interesting setup that the mansion is above ground, like you would expect, but the archive is almost all subterranean. So it Absolutely. is a really 
really wacky building. Um, so that internship was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, Jan Horak was the curator at the Eastman Museum at the time. Who's wonderful taught, guy, wonderful, wonderful guy. guy uh, really wonderful professor for me at the time too. Uh, and has gone on to work a number of places uh, since then, most recently the UCLA, UCLA Film and Television Archive. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, the combination of those film studies courses, the internship at Eastman, uh, getting a little more serious about doing something involved with film by way of doing the, the reviews for the, the, the student newspaper, and then as a bonus of that internship, I could watch whatever was showing at the uh, the repertory theater that Eastman runs, the Dryden mm -hmm. Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, th yeah, the Dryden Theater. Um, so I took advantage of that. And, you know, they had a series of East German films made by Conrad Wolf, uh, 50s, 60s. And I kind of just went to everything in the series because I could <laughs> as a bonus. So, the, the, the process of attending things to learn more about film, to, to doing those kind of deep dives on various filmmakers, various eras, that, that started campus, but then it kicked up a notch when I moved to DC and discovered how wonderful uh, the, the immediate year after college and uh, quickly discovered what an amazing place Washington DC was for repertory cinema, uh, AFI at the Kennedy Center back then. The National Gallery of Art, the Freer Gallery, uh, specifically Asian cinema, the Library of Congress had an ongoing program at the time. Uh, most of those were free. A AFI was uh, ticketed, but my God, in the 90s, tickets were like five bucks or something. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, the, the film studies began at college, but my but the continuation over the next 10 years or so living in Washington and being a, a regular film goer at these places, that's that's the real film education, I think. And and to, to connect back to, to where your question started, seeing those films properly, that's hugely valuable. I mean, yeah, I would still watch films at home too, but most of what I was watching in the 90s into the 2000s, I was watching in theaters. Well, and this actually sets up my next question, which is, you know, I'm sure you get this, like I get this, people like, oh, it's such a great job to have to look at all these movies, you know, and I haven't done the math, but you must look at thousands of movies a year. I know that, you know, you go to Sundance, Berlin, Cannes, Toronto, uh, to actually go and, and see the films, you know, when they're, when they're uh, you know, ahead of time. And what I'm, you told uh, uh, the post, uh, Anne Horaday, great, film critic for the post did a really nice profile of you a couple of years ago. And you told her that you like to see a movie on its feet in front of a real audience mm. uh, to see how it's going to play, uh, which is one of the things I've, I've got to say, and I've worked with a number of programmers at AFI, you know, over the 20 years that we've been there and they've, they've all been wonderful. Uh, it's AFI is a great place, but I, I've, I've really come to, to trust. I mean, there's been times when, when you're like, you know, this is going to be a great film. And I'm, I'm like, I don't know, but I've really come to trust your judgment on that. And, I, and I'm wondering if it's partly, I mean, obviously, you know, film really well, but I'm also wondering if it has to do with, with your, your sense of, of how it's going to play. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um... Well, where to start? Uh, that's that's very nice what you said at the end there, Chris. But but nobody bats a thousand with, <laughs> with these kinds of things. Yeah. And and you know there there are films that you might really believe in the, the the quality of the film, the message of the film, and it just doesn't work uh, commercially for whatever reason. Uh, and, cursory... and just to be just to be clear, when you say work commercial, what you mean is that you know, and we both had this when you've got a film you absolutely love, you can objectively show what a great film it is and people just don't come out for it. That's, that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I do not, does not work. I mean, it, 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 it does not succeed commercially in its initial release. A cursory look at film history will tell you that there are lots of examples of films that made money in their day and are pretty much forgotten now. <laughs> and there are films that the critics didn't completely go for, the, the, the public didn't completely go for and they're now considered all time classics. Blade Runner being one of them, uh, Harrison Ford sharing the uh, script notes on test screenings of Blade Runner at last week's Oscars was a lot of fun. So, you know, the, the, the long-term picture is what really counts, but try explaining that to the, to the filmmaker or filmmaking team who's 
very ambitious film didn't work out in the initial month of release. It's, um, it's a tough aspect of it. So what you were talking about with film festivals and uh, you know, the, the big film festivals of the world, Cannes Film Festival, uh, Toronto, Berlin, of course, there's a lot of glitz and glamour that goes along with that. And that's all part of the show and, and promotion of everything that goes in with, with both the, the festival as a destination uh, and and launching these films. So, um, what? But what does that really mean in terms of what's going on there? I guess I think the thing I would want people to know is there are a lot of different people from a lot of different sectors of the industry attending those film festivals, and they're all kind of experiencing the festival in different ways. Um, so that quote you're talking about from Anne has to do with the fact that that when you attend, like I do as a film programmer, I'm I'm going to see as much as I can see and scout out things that we're gonna play in the next year, either as first releases or in various festivals that we put on uh, every year, including the Labor Film Festival. So there's, for those, for those big festivals, you can't see everything. There is, there is too much. I, I'm pretty good about seeing 50 titles. Wow. And you know, maybe some of those I saw half of it and then I changed it up to go see something else because every hour of the day, you could choose between 12, 14 things to see at various theaters around the town. So you are, you are truly spoilt for choice, but you, you, gotta, you gotta make choices. So uh, that part that the, the quote was about was the fact that most of these big festivals have a press and industry schedule attended only by the accredited press and industry and then the public schedule. And Typically, I will do a mix of both versions. So, so a, a, a film that's in the competition selection will have both its public show, but also one, two, three, multiple press and industry shows. And because you can just sort of flash your badge and walk in, in theory, for the press and industry shows, you can, you can also leave after 15 minutes if you change your mind without you know, any big kerfuffle. Um, well, that that of course plays a role, but often I find that the reaction to a film, even a film that goes on to be a big hit, it might be might be a little stiff. People may not be laughing wholeheartedly. <laughs> Th things like mm. that. Mm -hmm. People might be checking their phones. It's it's a it's a working environment. Um, no, nobody paid thirty dollars for their ticket and it's their big night out and it can't it can that includes wearing a tux, right? Not not that setting. The public show is all that. You know that's. That is the premiere. That's where the filmmaking team is there on the red carpet doing, doing their pictures and their interviews. And everyone in that audience is there for their big night out. And I like seeing at least a few of those shows at those big festivals because yes, that is kind of like a test case audience, what that reaction is. And even though you can say, well, everybody loves everything at the big film festivals. And, and I, I know I've, I've said that kind of thing too. I mean, I know there, I know that it's true to an extent, but I think you can still kind of tell the difference when people go a, 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 another level above on, on the, re, the reception of a film. So that, that's what that quote was about, that it's also the first time, because it's a premiere, that's the first time that film is played in front of a paying audience. And I think you can kind of gauge the reaction uh, for something that might augur well for how that film's gonna go out into the world. And I, I'll just quickly say also, if you can kind of perceive how it might work as an awards candidate and how that narrative might start. Cause it does, it does start. Uh, the, the first public manifestation of that is at these film festivals. So before we get onto the, the actual films and, 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 and uh, your, your picks as it were, um, the other thing you told Anne, and I just love this quote because I, I, I know what you're talking about. You know, you talk about, you know, the, the glamor and the history and all of that stuff about film, but you, you told her a lot of the work involved in putting stuff up on screen is just logistics. The first you, thing you learn is shipping and purchase orders, <laughs> which I think, you know, again, people probably think, oh, you get to sit around and watch movies all day long and they have no idea about what you actually spend your days doing. Uh that's true. That that is still a, an answer, <laughs> a, point, <laughs> a point I make from time to time. Um, and I, you know, my my first job with with AFI Silver was doing handling the shipping, uh, the shipping and the booking and all that. And even though that's not a primary duty for me right now, um, it is 
absolutely a true statement in terms of what's essential about how you make a theater work. Uh, e e people might assume, aren't things digital right now? Or, or what does that mean? I was going to ask that. So we don't have to ship as many 70 pound metal buckets of film as we did when it was all celluloid. We, that's been replaced with a, you know, a two pound hard drive, but there's still, there's still a shipping aspect to it. Um, longer conversation, the, the logistics have changed, but there's still logistics. Um, but uh, I, I have an appreciation of that aspect of it. And it was, it was even more of a thing uh, another big thing in digital is that you can have 10, 20, 30 copies of a film uh, relatively easily and, and at low cost. Uh, when you had to pay 2000 bucks, 2000 bucks a, a pop to a film lab to have multiple copies of prints, prints that if you got scratched, it was now permanently scratched. Yeah, yeah. That was a very different proposition. And guess what? When films are new and making the festival circuit, they don't have 30 copies of them. They, they have one print that has the train Ooh. ship every festival so that was an era when you that film came in for a three-day four-day period you had your two shows and you had to get it out and sent maybe around the world to mm -hmm. its next festival destination at pretty significant cost um so that was that was a different era and 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 you know among other things what digital has has brought and it's a it's a long list and it's a mixed list uh, but it's it's changed in some helpful ways uh, the onerous aspects of scheduling and shipping, um, in that in that in that regard. Again, that's a that's a lengthier topic. But you know it, something from before about the watching a thousand films a year that I, I wanted to to speak to. Mm -hmm. I don't see a thousand films a year. I I see multiple hundreds of films a year, okay. and I am able to pick and choose a little bit, a little bit, which helps. But um, the people who do see perhaps a thousand films are the people working for film festivals that are open submission and everything's got to get looked at. Like if, if you, if you worked on a, a medium, just a medium sized film festival as a screener screening committee, you, you can log a few hundred just on that one festival pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't all get into the festival. So yeah, that's, that's where the volume comes from. Um, like I said, I'm able to pick and choose what I watch a little bit. There's it's still a bit of a guessing game, but uh, I think I probably log 400 a year pretty consistently. Um, you know, both things I have to watch for work, things I choose to watch on TCM at home. Uh, <laughs> but I, I want to mention Abby Algar and Ben Delgado. Thank you. I was, I was just about to go yeah. there. We are a team, uh, a programming team, and I, well, I've been at AFI Silver since 2003, and I've, I've worked with a, a few different programmers over those years. Not, not that many, actually, uh, a short list, including a brief stretch where it was just me, and um, that, was a, that was a lot. <laughs> there goes the PTSD right there. That was, that was, a, that was quite a stretch of time, yeah. Um, and all I want to say is I've, I've got the best team possible uh, right now, and we, we cover a lot of bases together, and that's what allows us to do all the all the programs that we do. Abby and uh, Ben are the great. Of the year. Yeah, yep. I love working with them. Uh, I have a I have got to take this up. You're reminding me. I have a picture somewhere. I can't remember wh where you were. We showed uh, uh, Ramin Barani. Mm -hmm. Uh, we actually, we showed all of his films. All his Whatever films. happened to that guy? <laughs> Whatever happened to that guy? White Tiger, people, if you haven't yeah. watched it, right? It's on Netflix. But uh, this was early on uh, when we showed um, his, his very first film, Man Push Cart. Mm -hmm. And he literally brought the film down. I have a picture of him standing in the AFA lo AFI lobby, uh, mm -hmm. actually by the cafe, with the film canisters. I, I, I don't even remember why I took this picture, but I had a feeling it was, I need to find that picture because, you know, that he was, yeah. he was skinny. He was, a, you know, this, you know, just this little, you know, filmmaker that was not, you know, but you could tell right there, but, but that goes to your point of literally he, he brought that film, I think from, New, from York, New York, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I don't, I don't know if he, if he drove down or if he took the train down, but uh, yeah, he, he uh, personally schlepped it down with him, yeah. Yeah, that was, that's a very special moment. 
That's it for today's edition of Labor Goes to the Movies. We'll be back with part two of my conversation with Todd Hitchcock tomorrow when he'll share his favorite picks from this year's DC Labor Film Fest. And just a reminder that the film Haymarket is now screening online for free. Check the show notes for the link or go to dclabor.org and click on DC Labor Fest. There will be two labor discussions with director Adrian Pravica on May Day, Saturday, May 1st. The first is at 8 o'clock Eastern Time with labor historians Joe McCartan from Georgetown University and Stephen Breyer from the CUNY School of Labor. The second is at 8 o'clock Pacific Time, and that's with labor studies professor Dana Frank. Both will include Q&A with the audience, so you'll get a chance to talk with the filmmaker and with the labor historians as well. Thanks again for listening. See you at the labor movies. 